Hi everybody and welcome to the Inclusive Ship Show, the place to get practical insights to make inclusion happen in the business world. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be here with Poonam Sharma. Poonam, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Thank you so much, Thais. I think it's equally a pleasure for me to be here and to be sharing my thoughts. I think it's a huge opportunity. Thanks for that. Thank you. And let me share with you a few words about Poonam. So, Poonam Sharma is head OD and talent at Alchem. She's a seasoned human resources professional as well as an OD expert with over 14 years of diverse yet deep experience. Prior to her current role at Alchem, Poonam has led the DNI function for all city group companies in India. Poonam has been adjudged as the Young Professional of the Year in 2014 and amongst top 100 global diversity leaders in 2018 by the World HRD Congress. Under her leadership, Alchem India and the City Group have received several external recognitions. And Puna, my first question for you is, how did you get involved with inclusion and diversity? What's your story? Oh, well, thanks to be honest, you know, uh, I think my story really starts from my childhood, you know. As a child, my brother, me and my sister uh, always had equal opportunities to, uh, you know, decide our education, take our personal decisions, and even make very, very critical choices in life. And, you know, considering the socio-cultural context that I belong to in India, as well as the times we come from, uh, not many Indian women could do that. You know, I saw my peers struggling either on account of taking a decision with regards to their education or simply put their personal life or, or even larger decisions. You know, so for me, it was a tremendous opportunity to be able to do so. Uh, so when I took up diversity, I thought it was something more than myself, you know, an opportunity to contribute to the society, to work for equal rights for women, to, uh, you know, work for their fairness and yet stay meritocratic. So I think, you know, right from my childhood, I wanted to be involved in something which was more altruistic, uh, yet allows me an opportunity to be more than myself. Yeah. yeah. Well, not everybody values diversity and inclusion in the same way that you do, Poonam. And especially working in corporations, what's your killer argument to, uh, to convince people of the value of inclusion and diversity? True. So, you know, uh, whenever I meet a business leader and I'm asked a question regarding, uh, uh, you know, the value of diversity, I say, well, imagine an organization today, you know, which is global in nature. Uh, which wants to make a mark, let's say, in every hook and corner of the world and in every country and in every sort of a different customer. What will happen if it operates with a set of employees which do not represent such a diverse mix? You know, what will happen to the products that they produce? What will happen to the kind of understanding they bring to the table with respect to diverse customers? Uh, you know, the second case in point is really imagine an organization which is planning to sort of attract a diverse, diverse talent and yet has a non-inclusive culture. So, you know, essentially what I'm trying to say is that an organization that embraces diversity, you know, sort of gains a lot of diversity dividend, you know, either quantified by, let's say, an innovative uh, set of customers or a diverse set of customers, to put it correctly. Uh, a greater market share or a diversity dividend in terms of being established in every part of the world successfully and sustainably. So that's the killer argument. Wow. I know there is something, it's the first time that I hear this, ex this expression, the diversity dividend. I think that's so powerful and it's so like business language, right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And what's the most effective initiative that you've ever taken in this area? Um, well, uh, you know, that's a very good question. You know, while I'm totally, totally passionate about diversity, I think there is one initiative which I took in my role as the diversity officer of Citigroup in India, uh, which is very close to my heart. You know, so this is at the time when I joined City, almost 50% of women who left the organization voted 
the uh, existence of unconscious biases as a key reason for leaving you know biases for example in terms of that when women go through marriage maternity and even mobility they slow down in their career they are not aspirational anymore and you know uh, take a back footing in terms of productivity you know there was another very uh, strong bias in terms of that you know longer hours in office really uh, you know or a longer face time converts into higher productivity so the initiative that i took aimed that really sensitizing the leaders you know in terms of the unconscious biases that existed and also somewhere telling them about the impact that it creates on the other gender you know how difficult it is to have a non inclusive culture and yet work towards the organizational objectives so you know uh, really for this initiative phase i worked for a month very intensively with the dni research organization uh, which was uh, uh, you know notably known for its diversity and inclusion research we carved out a very powerful workshop which was based on corporate theater methodology so we you know sort of took actual instances from city india uh you know we played it out in terms of the role plays on how women on board on how women who are coming back from maternity or marriage feeling when they come back into the workplace of city india and i think that was the point when city leaders actually felt you know what they were doing it was all unconscious uh you know they were not able to understand what they were doing and how they were impacting women at the workplace so i think that was the more powerful most powerful initiative ever uh you know what i did additionally was to make it sustainable and ensure that these unconscious biases are you know totally totally removed from the system i sort of spearheaded the creation of an india diversity council led by our ceo uh, we created gender networks generational networks throughout different states and countries in india so that they support women in every corner when they join city uh and i think uh, within a year and a half of doing so thais we were recognized by nhrd and the national human resource network as one of the top 10 organizations for gender diversity and you know uh, we improved we became an inclusive workplace you know because unconscious biases are very difficult to point out it is very difficult to make people aware because there are much deep rooted and softer issues so till date that is very close to my heart Wow, yeah, well done. Congratulations, you know, for this Thank initiative. You. And there is something that you mentioned, you know, when you started doing the workshop with leaders, and actually yes. they were not aware yes. of the impact. Because yeah. I, I believe in in every diversity area, but especially when it comes to gender, there's this perception gap. You know, yes. women know what they are going through, but maybe sometimes male leaders they have no clue. It's not that they don't want that right. they you know that they don't want to uh, to take care of the situation. It's simply that they are not aware. Aware. So bringing that awareness to people so important. Very important. Yeah. And what's the most common objection you come across? And how do you uh, respond hmm. to that? you know uh thais uh, the most common objection and i would like to bring this point very beautifully in is that you know people feel that diversity and inclusion should always be quantified and at the same time the belief is that diversity and inclusion is only a good to have you know so i believe that while it is important to assign a metric and to measure the impact of diversity i think we're somewhere uh, you know not understanding the softer and the deeper underlying cultural issues or biases you know not everything can be quantified right so i believe that diversity is beautiful in a way because it's linked to culture it's deep rooted in the values attitudes and belief some part of it will definitely be visible in business numbers directly you know while others are for the leaders to understand you know others are more culturally built and you know it's very important for a leader to be mature to understand both the numbers part of it the strategy part of it and the culture and the humane side of it so that's what i would say i think there is a saying by einstein he says that not everything that counts can be counted yes. and not everything that can be counted counts Yeah I think it it relates nicely you know to what you've just said. Yeah you beautifully summed it up. Yeah. Yeah. And um 
you know, one of the common objections that I come across is that people think that diversity and inclusion initiatives, they go against the meritocracy principle. Yes. You know, leaders yes. that say, you know, I just want the best person for the job. You know, I don't want, I don't see people's gender or color or whatever, you know, yeah. how, how do you respond to that type of reaction? So, you know, somewhere I believe, to be honest, that diversity and inclusion is a journey, right? While affirmative action or, you know, some of the directives may be necessary to bring uh, not equality, but fairness in workplace, you know, more of diversity and inclusion should also be natural. But, you know, let's be practical. The truth is that uh, when I see a workplace, I see more number of men as compared to women. I see certain, uh, you know, uh, generations working in a different way as compared to others. So there are differences for sure, right? And it is important to take some interventions to bring them up the same curve. And, you know, if it were a perfect world, then diversity and inclusion would be so much more easier. But the fact is that we are all different. And it's important to ensure fairness, meritocracy, and not equality. You know, so fairness and equality should be understood very differently. The truth is that women are underrepresented in a certain way. The truth is that, yes, there can be unconscious biases. So import, it is important to take a good and a very practical view to that. Well, can you develop a little bit, Poonam, on the difference between fairness and equality? You said that there is a difference. Yes. Yes, yes. So, you know, fairness basically means that, uh, for example, if there were 50-50% uh, representation, let's say, of both the genders in the workplace, and there were no sort of unconscious biases, right? I would have possibly taken, uh, possibly, no particular steps or special steps for women to come up the curve right and to be more represented in the workplace now it's just fair to take steps to ensure there is you know more representation of women in the workplace because uh, you know somewhere they're not fairly represented in the mix right so that's the fairness part of it and hence some I mean, some of these initiatives are really necessary to ensure that you know those unconscious biases go away there is fairness and meritocracy in terms of uh, taking decisions regarding career regarding promotion and performance uh and equality is a little different from fairness uh so that's the whole point okay. and uh and what's the best way to respond to non-inclusive behaviors yeah so I think the best way to respond to non-inclusive behaviors, uh, Thais, is really to say that those behaviors are unconscious, right? So the moment I say and I tell my leaders that, look, these behaviors are unconscious, I think they all begin from a very positive space, that possibly they were unaware of these behaviors. And there is much more willingness and readiness to change it, right? And the second very positive way to ensure and respond to non-inclusive behaviors is to equip your leaders and people managers with the right mindset, with the right tools to be able to change themselves, you know, and become more inclusive. So there's a very, very uh, good point, which, you know, uh, I would say, uh, uh, I would say the inclusion dividend book clarifies. It says when you have to change somebody, always start from a positive mindset and a positive way and you know respond to behaviors by telling the other person that particularly or possibly they are unconscious right and that's where the whole change begins oh i like that like you know make people feel guilty to begin exactly. with right yes yes and um, what is the biggest mistake to make in this area I think the biggest, again, uh, mistake to begin uh, is to think that, um, you know, that diversity and inclusion is only a good to have, right? I think it is important to believe uh, for any leader or for any employee at large that diversity and inclusion is a business imperative. You know, diversity and inclusion is a humane intervention. It is equally required to business to progress and equally required by employees and human beings to feel valued in the workplace, right? So it is not only a compliance perspective, you know, or a good to have perspective. I think it is a need to have perspective. 
Okay, so really focus on the on the business case, is right? Yes. It would yes. be really focus on the business case. And which which had which what was the best piece of advice that we you were given, Funam? And which advice would you give to anyone who wants really to accelerate, you know, progress in this area? I think the best advice is, uh, you know, to firstly look at the cultural aspect of diversity and inclusion. And, uh, you know, to also view inclusion as a conscious effort. You know, it's very important to understand that diversity is a mere, you know, existence of differences, right? And just by being diverse, an organization cannot succeed. So my advice to diversity practitioners and professionals is, to make a conscious effort to create an inclusive workforce from every standpoint, right? And really start by first impacting the mindset issues. You know, before you sort of uh, even launch a diversity strategy or an initiative and you look at the business side, I think it's a very important step and an aspect to look at, uh, you know, the mindset side, the cultural barriers, you know, some of the attitudes and beliefs which may come in the way of inclusion. It's very important. You know, so uh, let me also give you an example that if in city, I would have just started by launching a diversity strategy and not impact the mindset, you know, through the whole intervention that we did of creating awareness of unconscious biases and building a management accountability around it. I think we wouldn't have succeeded in our diversity journey at all. Okay, but like, can we say also, can you say that that in itself was part of the strategy? Yes, like it could be a part of the strategy. The very, yes, the very the foundational beginning. Foundational part, maybe. No? Yes, it was the foundational part. So you're right. You know, so in a way, I'm saying that for any diversity and inclusion to be successful, I think the foundation needs to be very strong. And the foundation is in understanding the values and the beliefs and the mindset of your leaders and the people management. And what you see, well, what is trending now from your you know, point of view when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Uh, well, you know, what I feel is that in India, we were a little late on the global map to start with the diversity and inclusion efforts. And, you know, but I feel that we have made significant progress. I think the first important trend to note is that more and more business leaders and the CEOs, I think they are able to see a stronger linkage between diversity and inclusion and the business, right? So I was reading about this PWC report recently you know, where they had interviewed the CEOs, global CEOs, and around 85% of them believe that diversity and inclusion strategy has really made a difference to the bottom line, you know. So more and more leaders are coming up, taking management accountability for ensuring that they build inclusive workplaces. So that's a very positive trend to watch out for. And, you know, the second trend, I believe, Thais, is really uh, the whole principle of intersectionality. And I'll make it very simple to explain, which is that if we see some of our diversity practices and initiatives, especially the employee resource groups and the networks, right? They're typically woven around one or two at the max diversity attributes. Like we have gender networks, we have generational networks, right? But I think increasingly diversity strategies and initiatives will assume that every human has multiple facets and side. You know, so for example, if I'm a woman with special abilities and from a particular minority, you know, there will be diversity practices, there will be diversity networks that will cater to my multifaceted needs. So as we're becoming global, I think the intersectionality principle is becoming very important. And in India, there is a clear trending and assimilation of this principle of developing strategies which are more multifaceted and which are more inclusive of major differences. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, something that you mentioned before, the import, you said that it's important that people focus on in the inclusive culture. Yes. You know, it's like diverse yes. is not that, the inclusive. Maybe in, this inclusive mindset and inclusive culture, maybe it, 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 it is a good response to that intersectionality as well. Yes, that's what I mean, because this, the, yes. an inclusive mindset, it's an inclusive mindset of all different aspects of a human being, usually. Right. No? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of connectedness there as well. 
And uh, do you have a favorite book or a favorite TED, TED talk in, in inclusion and diversity? Yes, the favorite book is uh, that I just told you about is Inclusion Dividend. Wow, and, so it's the name of a book. Yeah. Yes. I, who's the yes. author? It's Mason Donovan who's written the book. And I think it's, it's beautifully, it talks about, you know, brings diversity very closer, you know, to uh, business. And some of the thoughts which are pioneering have come from the book. For example, the very thought that how do you change, you know, a person's behavior from becoming non-inclusive to inclusive? It talks about that it's a journey, that you should start by putting a person or a leader in a positive space by saying, hey, you know, that behavior is possibly unconscious. And, you know, if you sort of move from unconscious bias to becoming more inclusive, these are the benefits you will realize. So it's a beautiful book and it links diversity to business very, very nicely. Ah, great. That, that will be on my to-do list. You know, I'm, I'm traveling soon on holidays and now I'll make sure I, I'll, I'll have this book. And yeah. any, any favorite quotes? Uh, well, not really a favorite quote, but uh, a very, very practical belief that I have is that uh, Inclusion is something that is not something that, uh, you know, we should have. It's something that is the need of the hour, right? I think, uh, you know, with globalization becoming the order of the day, with companies expanding, you know, for example, if you look at Google, right? Google wants to make its search engine available to a consumer in every part of the world and in every language. So I think it's important for the companies and for the ecosystem to become so much more inclusive of the differences that we have. So becoming inclusive is the need of the hour. And somewhere I also fundamentally believe that with, you know, so many protectionist policies, you know, uh, coming into being, I think inclusion hence is becoming even a stronger narrative from the political, sociocultural and the individual standpoint. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, wow, thank you so much, Poonam. I enjoyed so much our conversation. Very, thank very you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thais. You're welcome. I mean, I, I, I am the one to thank you. you know, it's great to have your presence, presence here. And thanks, everybody, for watching us. And let us know, actually, what are your key insights from this conversation? You can feel free to leave your comments below. Feel free to, to like this video, to share it, to subscribe to my channel. And if you want to learn more about how I support companies on their inclusion journey, feel free also to visit my website, theclickinternational.com, D-E-C-L-I-C international.com. I hope to see you at the next episode. Until then, embrace differences and make a difference. Bye. 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 Thank you, Zahir. Bye.